Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar that we're going to kick off at this moment. My name is Stefan Mayer. I am guiding you in this space of a series of webinars that have been taking place for almost a year. Today, the topic is the climate governance experiences in Central America and the Caribbean. And before we begin, well, I am going to give you some general information about the platform we're using. This is the Voice Voxer, which is a little bit different from which you are used to using in other platforms like Teams or Zoom. Right here, we have some uh, group chats that's more for informal communication, like to greet each other. And we have the audience questions, which is basically if there is any question about uh, the presentations to any of the speakers of the webinar. We are recording the webinar because of its information. What is different in this platform is that, let's say, I have uh, the voice of a person that is uh, speaking, so we want you to please write your questions in audience questions, and we will eventually cover those questions in the discussion with the speakers and also at the end in the Q&A and at the end in the conclusions. And with this, I will now give the floor to Sandra Spies, who is the Project Director of Acción Clima, for the welcoming remarks. Sandra, please. Very well. Thank you very much, Stefan. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving us the introduction and for allowing me to give you a very warm welcome to our fourth webinar within the framework of the EK interface for Central America and the Caribbean. The objective today is that we want this to be space to exchange experiences between projects and also the best practices of the EK projects in the region with regards to the incorporation of the relevant stakeholders in the elaboration and implementation of the NDCs. We decided that we were going to talk about uh, concrete and tangible examples of the region with regards to design, update, and development of climate policies that allow us to comply with the climate objectives of the countries. And that is why today we have three very interesting presentations where we will be able to learn in more detail the processes, results, and lessons learned in the update of the nationally determined contributions of Costa Rica and Guatemala. So thank you very much to the speakers for sharing their information in this space. In addition, we will have a presentation of the New Climate Institute that elaborated a guide for the development of long-term strategies, another important instrument for the climate policy for a low emission, low greenhouse gas emission development. So we hope that this knowledge is useful for everyone and we invite you to participate fully, as they say here in Costa Rica, very actively with your questions through the audience questions. The topic of governance is sometimes uh, theoretical. It's interesting because if you ask for the definition of governance, you can have lots of different answers. And in this sense, I hope that both the input that we are going to have today as well as the questions and the discussion about this could enrich us in the knowledge about these climate governance elements that are so important. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about the True Voice Boxer. We're using this platform. The fact that you are listening to me means that you are able to get into the Voice Boxer platform. And I think that some of you know this platform for, uh, from the exchange we had in October last year. The tool allows us to offer the session today in Spanish as well as in English so that we can reach a greater range of projects in the region in Central America, the Caribbean. And since we are using it for first time for a whole event and we're also getting to know it, we ask you for some uh, patience if there is any technical issue that may arise. So we are learning together and we're trying to find the best ways of uh, developing this regional interface. Without further ado, I say that I just want to say that I hope you enjoy this virtual session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. In case you prefer to select to listen to us in English, there is a, a button on the left hand side where you can select the language uh, that you are listening. If you want to listen to floor, uh, whatever language is, is, is currently spoken, English or Spanish. Entonces, okay, well, what are we having today? We already went through the part of the welcoming remarks by Sandra Spies. The agenda is structured in such a way that we have three presentations that provide different uh, perspectives to the topic of climate governance. Beginning or at the beginning, we are going to listen a little bit about the lessons learned in the formulation of the NDCs in Costa Rica by Diego Arguedas from the Climate Change Direction of the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. Then we have a brief Q&A session. And then we move to the presentation by Maria Jose Leiva, who is an advisor on ecosystem-based adaptation in Cuencas Verdes Project, Defensores de la Naturaleza Foundation. And she will tell us a little bit about the creation of enabling conditions to scale the ecosystem-based adaptation and integrate it to the NDCs in Guatemala. From there, again, we will have some time for Q&A. And then we move to Pablo Lopez from the New Climate Institute that he will be presenting a little bit about the guide that has been made by the New Climate Institute. And it focuses on making long-term strategies for low greenhouse gas emissions uh, development come true. So he's going to give us kind of an initial idea what is the structure, and perhaps we can also get to some other details on how to apply this and how this could be useful for you. Then with that, we get to some conclusions. We're going to see which are like the lessons learned on this topic and which are perhaps some definitions that may have come from these different perspectives. And then we will look, uh, close, as always, at the end. We are going to have an evaluation of this space to be able to improve it through time. And we are thinking about closing at 9.40 Costa Rica time. So this is just for us to have an idea of the agenda. So with this, I would like to invite Diego Arguedas from the Climate Change Directorate of the Ministry of Environment and Energy in Costa Rica for him to explain to us 
Well, for him to tell us a little bit about the lessons learned in the formulation of uh, Costa Rica's NDCs. Diego, please, are you here? Let's see where he is. Hi, Stefan. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I apologize. I from, I'm from Anka Trin's account because of a problem that we had in the Climate Change Directorate, but I really want to thank Anne Katrine to uh, allow me using her account. Thank you for the invitation. I work in the Climate Change Directorate. And last year, I was in the process of the construction of the NDC, the Climate Change Director. Ms. Campos asked me to excuse her to tell us a little bit about the process. My field is communication, and it's kind of a strange that somebody in communication is explaining how a governance process was made. But in this process specifically, it was valuable and useful for somebody to explain this because from the beginning we realized two things. One, that communication has to be centered in the process, that from the very beginning of the process we wanted to understand how we had to tell the citizenship and uh, the people about the, this document. This is a document that is very important for the country from the very beginning. And this is key instrument that has to be understood, not just as a climate governance instrument, but also country development, country well-being, and to be able to convince the citizens that this is a serious document, that it is a document for well-being that was useful. We thought it was valuable from the very beginning to put people from communication to start shaping it and structuring it. So that is why we are here in this space. Some of the back background, you know this, every five years, and it's the cycle that we have, and it's good for the lessons learned. The countries present their climate goals. Costa Rica presented the last one in 2015 before the uh, Paris uh, Meaning, and then we, uh, the carbon Paris, and we presented this as an advance because since 2015, Costa Rica has developed two key documents. First, the national policy for climate change action in 2008 that was a key policy and allowed us to understand very well what is the general framework of uh, Costa Rica. We have three main areas, three instrumental areas in Costa Rica, and this provides like the roadmap for adaptation. One year after one, we have the National Decarbonization Plan, which is a long-term strategy under the Paris Agreement for Costa Rica, which proposes the goal of being net zero by 2050. So after the NDC in 2015, we had two big projects, two big goals that were very clear. And the intention was to articulate these goals as part of the country development process. So since we want to do it this way, we designed a process that's a participatory process, and Felipe Leon was the one that coordinated this process. Actually, all the NDC, we were very visionary, and if we were not widely open and really engage a lot of the groups, then we were not going to have a solid NDC. In general, our transforming vision for the country, and this is key, NDC is transforming. And we have three key words. Four key words is decarbonized, fair, adapted, and resilient. And this is because the NDC will serve at the end for Costa Rica to be a better country. And another key aspect, and you're going to see the rest of the document, is that it will be a better country because it is including all the people and it's within the framework of human rights and well-being, particularly for the most vulnerable populations. So this climate justice is a key element in all the industry and the way in which we created it. As the more technical part, we have some general elements. Costa Rica increased the ambition of the absolute objective compared to the one that we had in NDC 2015. But I don't remember the figures exactly, but it was over 9.11. We put it down to 9.11 to align this number one with the roadmap of the decarbonization plan. And secondly, with the objective of net zero emissions by 2050. This is also an innovation we didn't have before. We have a maximum budget of emissions for the period of implementation of the NDC, the 10 years, 2021 to 2030. 
This is something or this uh, goal allows us to have a clear idea of what will be successful or not successful in the NDC. If we exceed this uh, goal, although we get to the absolute maximum of 9-11, if we exceeded this one, we wouldn't be covering our contribution. So this gives us like an extra level of control to the citizens and to the people working on these uh, climate actions in the government, we have kind of an extra level of commitment to accomplish the goals. And in adaptation, we have adaptation and mitigation, but in adaptation, this is aligned with the objectives of the national adaptation policy, and it has to work on the social, economic well-being of the country, and the idea is to cover areas for decision-making, adaptation criteria, then having adaptation of public services, productive services and infrastructure, and the nature-based solutions. So those two big goals in mitigation and adaptation help us structure the NDC in two big areas. But in spite of this, we decided we didn't want to separate it in the components or the contributions, but we actually wanted to integrate everything in a holistic way, I mean, we have this vision of climate action vision. So a goal that could contribute in adaptation and mitigation, we didn't want to separate it, but we just want a single big container in thematic areas, which is what we decided for at the end for the country to be unified. So if we think about infrastructure, we can have low emission infrastructure, but it also has to be resilient. So we think about this more in the sense that it's more valuable to have a more central vision, a more structured vision to be able to set up an NDC based on this. So what other elements? We had, yes, adaptation and so on, but I want to tell you a little bit about the construction process, which is valuable for this seminar. So we started from two big ways of gathering and processing the information. We have a qualitative method, and for this, the modeling team at the University of Costa Rica and the upper lab from the electricity, uh, electrical engineering school was essential. They have worked on several studies, and we have been able to advance in the climate modeling processes. For example, last year, that was like the modeling of the cost-benefit study for decarbonization of the economy in Costa Rica. And with this modeling group, what we did was to test a lot of assumptions. So we did not know how the future is going to be. But if we start moving a lot of variables, we can create a world of visionaries. So we created more than 3,000 scenarios. And with those scenarios, we started to test what happened in each one if we applied our assumptions and our public policies. So this is what we had on the one hand as a quanti uh, as a very clear uh, quantitative measure of what could happen in our scenarios so that we could generate robust public policies that could be adapted to most of the scenarios. And then we also realized that the models, which is something else that we saw, the models are lacking. They're lacking, you know, that human imagination that occurs when we tell stories among ourselves, when we start telling each other why things matter. So we need that extra human factor. So in parallel, we wanted to run a process of future participatory scenarios. This was led by some specialists from the University for International Cooperation, and the idea was to have a big group of people from different sectors and start imagining what could happen in their sectors in the future, and from there see which were the most important elements coming out of there and put them back into the evaluation system to feed one with the other. And these are the clusters in which we work with the narrative modeling teams, let's say. So it's different clusters between well, September and October. And based on these clusters, and we got more than 300 people participating in this. So from all this, we got a group of assumptions that then we tested in the part of modeling. And then we added everything in three action areas. If we see these, none of them is just mitigation or just adaptation. Actually, we wanted this more uh, classically mitigation. 
which is more energy, but it also has components on how the system becomes resilient. And the intention of all this was for this to be a very integrative document. And something else that is important is that it is aligned not just with the National Plan for Decarbonization, but also a public policy, which is called the National Strategic Plan, which is a document from the Ministry of Planning that intends to trace the roadmap for the 2050. And this is important because the NDC not only had to be good in itself, but it also had to permeate into other public policy instruments. How the document looked very quickly, this is the thematic area of energy. We had a little introduction of what our vision is, what we think is important, take advantage of our resources, the sustainability, and limit or reduce the use of fossil fuels. So one by one, and then we have some contributions. As you can see in the document, and something that is done here, but that is important is that for every individual contribution, for example, for this first one, we included the way it, it overlapped with a series of agendas like the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN. So each objective that was uh, related to these goals, like energy here, there was a little icon in the printed document. And when we have the document in a more interactive format in the web, it's going to be the same. And this gave us a possibility of being clear about what is overlapping in terms of well-being between the NDC and the rest of the processes in the country. And also the other great component of this agenda was other processes that were not necessarily from the SDGs, but for example, the Sendai goals, the goals from the Biological Diversity Agreement of the Convention for uh, there's seven or eight different conventions we have also the Kigali goals for the reduction of greenhouse gases. So we were very clear in terms of which one, where each one was connected to the others. And for us, this is key to show how they're connected. Other key things about the NDC, these are some of the big goals. For example, this one of 2022, 30% of the ocean under a type of protection scheme. It's less than 3% now, so this is a very ambitious goal. But for each indicator, and you can see that in our webpage in cambioclimatico.go.cr, you can see the whole thing. A couple of innovations in the part of quantitative and qualitative also, the combination of the processes, and the fair transition. Before thinking about all the contributions, we have a whole chapter on how to do this transition in a fair way. Because it's not just about including the contributions and thinking that everything's going to be great, but also how you impact first the people that work in the industries that are going to be reduced in size. For example, Costa Rica, the, the workers from the gas stations and other people associated to fossil fuels, and also how to include populations that were not directly linked or that do not have a big voice in terms of climate elements. So these groups that we included is the Afro uh, community women group, the transsexual community, indigenous groups, people with disabilities, and the elderly. And what we did for each of these groups was to create some spaces, some conversations, not consultation, but really just an exchange space to, to see the process with a draft of ideas. So we presented to them the process, and this is a process where they have not been historically included so that they, we can then get their feedback. So these here are some of uh, the examples. We had more than 10 spaces of conversation with these groups. Some of them, for example, the transsexual community, they said they had never had a space to talk about climate change. And it is a really vulnerable uh, community that if we do not take into account uh, their punctual needs, the NDC is not going to be the correct NDC. And so also the indigenous communities, and there were also some things related to some technical domestic assistance. And at the end, the document that came out is a stronger document and allowed us 
to present also a shorter vision on December 11th. We presented a more robust uh, document at the end of December with that structure. And I think that the key element for me, or the two key elements, is first of all, the diversification of the methods to get to the Zandisi, and is that we were able to use quantity and qualitative methods, and that was very rich because it gave us the possibility of finding different options or solutions to different problems, different lenses. And then Costa Rica, for Costa Rica, the vision is that NDC is a document for people. And if we're not taking all the measurements of the case, then we're not in the right document. And the process we made for the inclusion of the communities, the approach of the whole document for a fair transition is one of the most important efforts that Costa Rica has made so far in order not to leave anybody out in this transition towards a resilient economy. So I'm going to remain like this in my presentation. I thank you for the space, and I will be available for the questions. Thank you very much, Diego. Right now, I can't see any questions in the chat box. I don't know if anybody has a question for Diego right now. You can ask a question right now. I think uh, we've got one right over here. Let me see. And Catherine, and Catherine is asking, could could you share with the participants the link to, sh to to find the document, please, online? Let me see. So maybe you can elaborate a little further after this session. Are there any more questions from the participants? Diego is with us. If there is anything along the way in the next hour. There is a question by Karen. She's asking, she would like to know about the main funding strategies that were defined. So allow me to give you the floor once again so you can get to that. And thank you. Uh, Karine, the document uh, presents, it's more like an apparatus of climate governance and there are some general elements, but uh, that has to do with uh, two more processes that this office has. First, we are fine-tuning our, our, our structure uh, as connections that we have with a, the global market and I believe there is a core element on how we are going to include how we're going to include our climate policies in the multilateral fund and the second part is we are in a process and this this is let's say um, it has part of the democratization process we are in a process of renewing financial and the public finances in Costa Rica, 15, 20% of taxes come from uh, fossil fuels. So if we want to do away with the, or decarbonize this economy, and this is part of, we're gonna have to change our fiscal structure because there is going to be, uh, or to be able to mobilize internal funds because Costa Rica does not believe this is, it shouldn't only be funded by uh, cooperation funds, although we do understand it, uh, cooperation is important, but it, it's important to mobilize internal funds here in Costa Rica. And we are in the process of realigning these uh, fiscal structures. And we have a couple of um, projects just to be able to understand because, because we have the base documents of public policies and mitigation and the document on how to combine that. But we have to 
disaggregate that in individual projects so that we can fund each project individually. So right now we are in a funding strategy for the NS and we're coming up with an investment plan trying to find out, okay, out of this big giant NS, we need to fund this, this, and this. And then we're going to start looking for funding both internally and externally for each of these indicators. Thank you, Diego. We have two questions, two additional questions right now. The first one from Angelina Stark. In which sectors has Costa Rica been able to identify the strongest potential to reducing greenhouse um, gases further through the uh, 2020 NDC as compared to 2015? Thank you, Angelina, for your question. I believe the answer is very similar in 2020 as it was in 2015. We have a gigantic challenge ahead of us with when it comes to transportation and the um, transportation emitted emissions or the, the emissions by the transportation that's about 20% uh, of the country. I, I, don't, I don't have it. I don't have the clarity right now, but let me revisit that issue. I don't know how that changed, but the uh, challenge continues to be transportation, transport, and the 2020 goals are way more disaggregated and specific than they were in 2015. And that is in great part thanks to the fact that we're working based on the decarbonization national plan. and. Um, I don't know if I have it so clear which is the sector that has created the most opportunities in this cycle, but what I do know is that we have a greater level of detail. And something important to say here is Costa Rica took the long-term vision with this process and realized this is a mid-term and long-term process. So this five-year cycle allows us to think which are the capabilities that we need to develop for 2024 so as to be able to have an, an DC that is more and stronger then. And we're building upon that base. But Angelina, let me take your question and revisit that and I will get back to you. There is another question by Carolina, which measures are you considering on funding topics and the COVID-19 situation so that they are included in the themes of the NDC? At the macro level, the country has been negotiating various multilateral funding uh, options with the World Bank. Um, to have access to, to different sources of funding. We did that last year, and a core element of these negotiations with these funds is if the country, if the country has to commit to uh, climate compliance indicators with those funds to be released, and they, we have to uh, show very clearly how this is going to help us with the COVID-19 instead of doing backtracking to climate goals. So at the level of funding and the COVID-19, I believe the core way we are working with that, we have a fiscal deficit crisis right now in which internal resources are exhausted at this point. The most powerful way of linking the climate action to the strength and is making sure that whichever new funds that come in through multilateral cooperation and so on and so forth are aligned to this climate uh, policy that the country has one of the pillars of the negotiation is decarbonization so this is probably the uh, clearest way of doing the sustainable uh, recovery of COVID-19 which is a priority for the minister and all of that package. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Diego um, for for your clarifications and the further details in the process uh, linked to the NTCs. And now we are going to the next point in our agenda, and I'd like to invite Maria Jose Leiva, known as Majo. She's from Guatemala. She loves dogs, music, and sports. She is a biologist and specialized in the um, catty development uh, practices in Cati Costa Rica she will, and uh, gender studies. She works in climate change and allows her to keep the light of hope on, uh, waiting for humanity to wake up. She's an, a consultant on adaptation based on ecosystems from the Project Cuencas Verdes by the Fundación Defensores de Naturaleza. Um, Maria Jose, welcome. ready very thank you very much for that introduction you asked me to be creative so i try and be creative so good morning ladies and gentlemen to me it is a it is a privilege to be here speaking to you and um, just telling my tale telling the story this is an ongoing process a collective process that has been happening happening for about two years. It's a voluntary process for many different agencies and NGOs in my country that try to, um, how are we going to start the dialogue about uh, ecosystems and how this topic or this approach can actually get to reduce vulnerability and improve the adaptative capacity of people. But, um, this is including more strategies, policies, and, and what really makes the, the biggest challenge is achieving that ecosystem-based adaptation gets to be important when it comes to public policies and get to understand which are these governance arrangements that are necessary for these ecosystem based adaptation is uh, both sustainable through time let me see i don't know if i am just clicking Please click on the presentation directly. I'm clicking on it, but it won't it won't change the slide. Oh here we go, here we go. Sorry about that, sorry about that. So I was telling you Guatemala has um, gone through very interesting phases through a uh, consolidation process of the te a national technical team on EPA. But what happened? And what was our initial situation? Well, practically, we started with this process considering as well that Guatemala has legal instruments it has a legal framework related to climate change and instruments of public policy and the country has also ratified uh, international instruments on the different conventions related to eba such as the convention of uh, biological biodiversity and uh, some others and the uh, legal framework it's the uh, decree 2013 by the Congress of the Republic, which is the main element that regulates the mitigation and adaptation actions in the country. This is the birth point 
of the uh, National Plan of Climate Change in compliance with Article 11 of that said law. And we also have a national plan of development, which is, so to speak, the umbrella that will embody all of the different instruments related to environment and natural resources and climate change. In this, we have a very important line, which is the natural resources for today and for the future. And we have the program of forestry incentive, a very strong program, which are financial incentives granted to small landowners and large landowners, and they have different modalities uh, and different models of land um, holding for the forestry resources in the country. The NTC also represents an instrument of uh, public policies on climate change. This has already been in the process of being updated and uh, and we are working in the inventory of uh, these inventories and we did that with the support of the World Bank, a process of prioritizing this because we had between eight and nine different adaptation sectors. Nevertheless, we realize that not in all the sectors we have clear regulations or clear policies, neither information or reliable data as to be able to create reports. So we prioritize four different sectors and the technical, the national technical group of EPA, that was our target to do a cross-cutting nature of our um, well, none of these instruments uh, considers the AM uh, approach or its advantages and that has not been discussed at the national or institutional level here. Ready. So, sorry, 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 clicked away. Here I am. Despite the definition was created on EP8 um, uh, in the year 2010 in the country, as I said, we didn't really discuss that topic, and that's when we started with this collective process, voluntary process, with initiatives of projects and programs that are um, addressing the EPA. A lot of that related to NGOs and international cooperation agencies. It is over 30 entities and institutions. Uh, we are already institutionalized and we have been meeting regularly with a lot of engagement, very heterogeneous when it comes to the uh, represent representativeness of the uh, different sectors, the concept and what we understood was um, deeply discussed. And then we created a very important output derived from all of these meetings in which we considered using the concept, the global concept of AEPA, analyzing it and making it or standardizing with very specific characteristics in the country. For example, regarding the interculturality, how the EPA is an advantage or uh, a benefit regarding the interculturality of the country and the different cosmovisions that exist in the indigenous peoples in the country, that way of perceiving the world around us, uh, the uh, mixture of different knowledge, traditional and scientific knowledge, and the need to uh, protect resources such as water that is becoming scarce through time. And we also understand or including uh, territorial unit, units of planning, which is part of the uh, territorial ordering and municipal development, like the um, basins and micro basins. So we got to this concept of EPA in the country by integrating all of these elements, important elements. Now, what has been the timeline to constitute the technical national team. 
or TNT, we have taken very uh, decisive steps in order to engage other organizations as well as uh, civil society organizations and government agencies. We started in 20, 2009. We started, we, we had a, an assessment, sorry, 2019. So we have as an assessment to create a baseline and see which projects are working on this topic. And we had a, a first approach on the prioritization process in the uh, EPA according to the roadmap of the NDC, that, which was paid for or sponsored by the World Bank and the technical support of the um, OIM. So, and we have the interest of other organizations and we have the integration of the Ministry of Environment and the Office of uh, the National Council of Protected Areas, the National Institute of Forests, and then we have all of the most important institutions. We consolidated the group and we actually gathered all of the important elements as to be able to develop a route map. A route map that would provide us with a vision, a north star at the midterm and at the long term in order so that we could escalate and permeate that concept in all of the institutions so that we get to public policies. Sorry that uh, the arrows are going in the other direction. So we have the uh, first national forum on EPA uh, with over 100 attendees and it was a landmark in the country as to be able to provide visibility for the approach. What do people understand when they speak of EPA, which are the methodologies, which are the uh, available tools, what's uh, the commitment with international commitments that the country has assumed, and the necessary governance and financial mechanisms that can actually kickstart this type of uh, initiative. So we had that two days of technical forum with uh, technical tables. And the third day, we had a political forum, which was very important because we um, presented to the decision makers what was discussed in the first forum with all of the key messages. And we presented them with a statement of on the importance of the EBA, in which uh, we provided emphasis that it was absolutely fundamental to include EPA in the national policies in the country to actually commit to work into the enabling conditions to be able to promote their national scale. And uh, that provided us a lot of strength. In order to institutionalize and formalize more of the group, there is a formal request in the uh, national system of Guatemala for climate change. It's an entity that gathers scientific data and present it to decision makers regarding policies on the different climate change elements, vulnerability, adaptation, mitigation, uh, greenhouse effects, uh, greenhouse um, gas. Uh, and right now we in the workplace, the system about the system is that it supports the interinstitutional coordination scientific integration as part of the National Council for Climate Change. This council is presided by the chairman, uh, by the president, sorry, created according to a decree in 2013. After that, we had a petit comité to be able to gather all of the inputs of all of these elements in the route map uh, in order to consolidate the strategic objectives, SOs. At the same time, we have been formalizing this initiative and we had to at least have a handbook, a functioning handbook, what, what's going to be in the nature of the technical team. And uh, we decided uh, that its main target was to present technical and scientific evidence and to present 
information about the economic cost effectivity based on EPA and the adoption of interventions. In this functioning handbook, we have the members of the TNT uh, and the functions of this office is to be able to present the uh, governance of this technical group. This root map was validated through a very consensus process. And then we went to, we went on to discussion regarding the uh, EPA lines and which voids or gaps are there in Guatemala regarding the law in order to be able to uh, address this uh, approach methodologically. And the, after this route map uh, has been already supported by international cooperation agencies and NGOs, and we are looking to get the signature as of this year. The second forum was part of the uh, capacity building it was uh, a virtual forum, and the focus was provided on EPA as an opportunity for economic reactivation. We also had another political forum in which all of the conclusions were were presented to the different decision makers and the elements of the route map. Last but not least, which is the, the last work we did, is the assessment on potential indicators that could provide us with information on APA. Sorry. EBA progress at the national level. Very well. What does it mean? Um, what does the root map represent to us? It's institutional uh, commitment signed on 2019 about including EBA in the updates of the NDCs. It has nine strategic objectives. The first objective is how, how do we manage the measuring of impacts and benefits of the implementation EBA for the progress reported. So we had a very exhaustive exercise last year in which we wanted to actually pay attention to the methodology of the EBA in which they classify based on the definition all of the most important elements and criteria. We took that concept of the uh, EPA, segregated that in concepts and criteria, and we had a very large repository of potential indicators related to the EPA at the country level, and then we analyzed that. We have 48 uh, potential indicators came out of that process, and we got to assess eight main indicators that can provide us information on EBA. Two important elements were availability of information and reliability of data. So the f steps to, to be followed right now, we want to do a pilot, a first assessment of the indicator status and create a baseline for the country, how to interpret it, what information does it render, and then assess at the municipal level or project specific as a, um, and find out if there is any synergy uh, between the in-country level and local level, and then just validating all of those results with the most important entities. These are the next elements or objectives of the route map. The second objective is having a strategy to raise funds as to be able to implement EBA uh, interventions and validated by the most important sectors. The third objective is to actually strengthen in the institutional um, uh, capacities or capabilities and uh, capacity building in different NGOs and the, through the different sectors. Another SO is actually creating the incorporation of the EBA focused communications on climate change focused communications. We uh, has already been uh, achieved. And Thank you, Maria Jose. We have about two minutes to answer questions. If we find any, K. 
Karen is asking, or she has actually two questions. One of them is, uh, I saw the logo of the waterfront in your slides. Uh, this, is, this is a proposal you also want to scale. That's one. And two is, what is the participation of the private sector in these uh, workshops? Will you align this with the EBA? Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, well, the fund, uh, the, the water fund logo is there because definitely it is a mechanism of a uh, governance mechanism, a financial mechanism that we have identified throughout this process. And well, in the project we are implementing, we are trying to promote a water fund for the whole protected area and the reserve of biosphere Serra de las Minas through this planning process that it focuses on the EBA. So how do we make sure that companies like the hydropower companies that are in the water basin, how they support uh, concepts uh, through the economic assessment of the water resource in order to improve their productive processes. So we have good experiences from the water fund, and we think that this is uh, very important for this to escalate this approach. The other question was, oh, I forgot. What was the participation of the private sector in the workshops? With regards to EBA, of course. Yes, I'm sorry. Well, the participation of the private sector has been good so far. In Guatemala, we have a chamber of industry. This chamber of industry uh, gathers all the associations that represent the different productive activities and industrial activities of the country. And the good about this is that since it is a heterogeneous group, we have NGOs, international cooperation, and each one has also had a good relationship with this chamber of industry. So the chamber of industry also has a department or a direction that focuses on the environment, which is something that, of course, they're also interested on to be part of the process. So it has been very good, but we do want to get to even more representatives of the private sector. Thank you, Maria Jose. So far, I don't see any other question. Thank you for the presentation and for answering the questions that came up with this. And I want to move to the next point and invite Pablo Lopez. Pablo is a chemical engineer from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Now he has a master's in energy sciences from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And in the New Climate Institute, he focuses in the development and promotion of policies for climate change mitigation. And he dreams about seeing a decarbonized world, not just by 2050 and afterwards, but even before that. And before coming to New Climate Institute in Berlin, he was the program manager in CCAP, the Center for uh, Policy in Washington. So welcome, Pablo. Pablo is going to give us a different dimension, like a tool, some guide, that can perhaps help us structure the whole process to get to the long-term strategies. So Pablo, welcome. And floor is yours from now on. Please go ahead and you move your slides uh, by clicking in the presentation, okay? Thank you, 
Thank you very much, Stefan. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks to the other participants for their participations. They are, have all been very interesting. My presentation actually is a little bit different. It's a topic that's uh, not so much applied to a particular country, but more theoretical, more general, and focused a little bit more to the longer term. This is some work we have been doing in the LTSs, the long-term strategies, the long-term climate strategies, which are, oh well, and a little bit the guide that we developed, that it includes three general concepts that we believe should be included in a long-term strategy. And as you will see, it has a very close uh, link from our perspective with the NDCs. These are the three concepts that we describe in this guide as no climate, and we believe that they should be always included in the LTS and an effective LTS. The first one is that it is a document that has to be done only that it doesn't have to be done just once. It has to be in constant review, in constant updates. The second one is that each country has to develop its strategy based on the conditions in which they, uh, that they have. There is no specific format to develop strategy. So we, we have to consider the current and local conditions in each country. And the third one is a little bit more in content, the eight key aspects that we believe an LTS should contain. This uh, first one has to do with the frequent review, frequent revision, and this is where we also have the part of the indices. The long-term strategies, these are documents that are being uh, developed. They are requested under Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, and they should be developed with a perspective to the year 2050. Science, of course, changes through time. So now the objective is that the economies try to get uh, uh, try to get to a complete decarbonization by 2050. So this obviously is done at a short term of five years with the NDCs. And the idea is to constantly revise both at the same time. Every time the indices are revised, then the LTS should also be revised to be able to adapt to these uh, things. Uh, this is a chart of the recommendations made by the IPCC with regards to the reduction of emissions and how, as time goes by, not in terms of reduction of emissions, then the recommendations may change. The recommendations that were made in 2007 are very different from the ones that were made in 2018, and not just because uh, there were not big reductions accomplished at the global level, but also because science changes. So the needs for negative emissions, net negative emissions, will be updated as science is updated too. So all this with the objective, of course, of increasing or maintaining the temperature rises to 1.5. As I was mentioning in Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, the uh, communication of these long-term strategies is important taking into account these objectives related to temperature increase. Also, the set of the NDCs in terms of emission reduction does not necessarily take us to that point in which we limit the increase in temperature. So we have to make sure that the NDCs as well as the long-term strategies bring us to that objective, to that decarbonization. In the same way, the framework convention requires that we present these strategies but there is no guide or there is no specific detail on how they have to be developed. So this uh, guide, this presentation, wants to give some structure to all this. The status quo, well, this is a document that was developed in late 2019, and it talks about the countries that are already developing strategy or thinking about developing strategy 
and whether or not that strategy is aligned with the Paris Agreement. So this is the NDC update report that has several interesting areas. I just wanted to show this to you for you to see that a year ago half of the countries were already, if not developing, at least starting the process to develop strategy. This first concept of aligning the NDCs and the long-term strategies is precisely for a strategy to be a vision document that is constantly revised and used in the same five-year cycles for the revision of the NDCs so that you can make adjustments as you accomplish or not the objectives of the countries every five years. So you can make the necessary adjustments and the measurements in these strategies depending on how conditions change. And obviously, the long-term vision also helps us think about what the intermediate steps we have to take should be to get to the final objective. And that is why the fact that the NDCs, the intermediate steps, are all linked with the LTS, which is the final objective, seems to be something very important. Once again here, we have a more graphical perspective on how every five years you can make adjustments of the two so that this could be a continuous revision process and that this is adjusted both to the needs of the country to get to decarbonization as well as to the new discoveries or the new recommendations made by the science of the IPCC. This obviously has a lot of benefits. The fact of having political consensus really facilitates planning both at the short as well as the midterm. It generates a certainty in private investment when you have a clear direction at the long term. And this is very important to really accomplish in the transition, not just energy transition, but also to processes that are more compatible with the Paris Agreement and with these objectives. Same thing with climate financing. If there is a clear strategy at the long term in how the international funding is going to be used, the climate funding, and if there is a portfolio of projects, then it's easier to have access to the funds. And, well, really, also, the same development of the NDC can be facilitated even more if it's done within the framework of a strategy that is updated and very closely related. The second concept is the development of the long-term strategy within the national context. That really, the recommendations should take into account the current situation of each country, the resources that they have, the information that they already have to. And for this, this guide suggests three levels of complexity. And later on, we're also going to see the eight key aspects. And this general, there may be more basic uh, versions, more detailed versions, depending on the information that is available. And also in each of the concepts, we have a space enough to have that different level of complexity. So there is a point where there is little resources, little information, but in the same way, I mean, you've got to get started. Then there is an intermediate vision in which we have more data, projections, scenarios, funding, and a third version, which is a detailed version, and it's based on a more, more rigorous analysis. The circumstances, the national contexts, the on the availability of technical and financial resources. So there may be things like what you can do with few resources, what you can do with more resources, human resources, also government agencies, both for the coordination as well as for the presentation and the analysis of the different measurements, and a political mandate and the leadership that is very important to really push a process of this type forward when you have 
a high level mandate, the institutions have more pressure and they have this uh, mandate to really work on the different measures and make the corresponding analysis. And the third concept is the eight key aspects to consider in developing a long term strategy. And it's these eight. We apply here also the concept of the three different levels of complexity. So depending on the information you have, depending on the infrastructure or the governance that the country might have, then you can get to a higher level of, of detail. First is the process. This one talks a little bit more about the governance, about the governance of the ministries or the secretaries that are in charge of their interdisciplinary committees, what we were listening to that they're doing in Guatemala. Also, institutionalized the implementation of the NDC, the development of an NDC for the implementation of measurements that we should also have this vertical uh, nature at the national, local level, at the regional level to have the corresponding coordination to accomplish successful implementation of the different measurements. The second one has to do with the long-term scenario analysis. So the idea is to also have the impact could have in the reduction of emissions and not just by 2050 at the long term, but also with the intermediate steps, including different, let's say, technological solutions and different ambitions, let's say, in terms of what we can reach. We always begin with a baseline, a business as usual, and a more ambitious scenario. And the more scenarios we have, the more or, or the strategies. The third one has to do with the goals for emission reduction and other sector objectives. Obviously, we are promoting and we are accomplishing uh, that the final objective is decarbonization by 2050. But at the same time, it is also important to have other objectives at the sector level, not just uh, reduction of emissions, but also those that are not related to greenhouse gases. We can talk here about, let's say, the percentage of electricity generation with the renewable energies, electrification of transportation, the deforestation rates, which are all very important strategy, and they not they do not necessarily have the direct component of emission reduction. The fourth one is sector coverage. Also, again, available. Then, obviously, it is advisable to begin by those sectors that have the greatest impact and start with them and as the strategy is revised or updated we can include more sectors and more details in each of those sectors. As we were saying, the link with the short and midterm measurements at the end saying we're going to reduce 100% of our emissions by 2050, it's easier then saying how we're going to accomplish that and which are the steps that we have to take to be able to accomplish that every five years. So that coordination, that link is very important and it also has different levels of complexity. In terms of financing or funding and technology, it is very important for the countries to know what are the needs they have or they will have to be able to accomplish those intermediate or final objectives. A funding strategy, as we mentioned, especially international climate financing could really facilitate the implementation of different technologies and that the country would really be able to know what are the gaps and should have a strategy to fill those gaps. That's all very valuable. 
el siguiente es el desarrollo sostenible. The next one is the sustainable development and fair transition that we have to think not just about the chance of CO2, but also the sustainable development goals in a more holistic way and a fair transition that we have been talking a lot about that lately. Also, we have to focus on the most vulnerable communities and those communities that have been most affected by that transition to low emission methods. And well, the next steps, we should always have that level of clarity and we should always clearly communicate what the next steps are within the strategy. How often is it going to be revised? How is it going to be revised? What measurements will be improved in each of the reviews or revisions? and communicate all this and the methodologies in a transparent way. Very quickly, I wanted to give you an example of what I mean when I talk about these three versions, when I talk about the basic, intermediate, and detailed. The guide that is available to be consulted has examples for each of these concepts uh, included in there, examples from the real world. So I really invite you to check the guide. And this is something that I'm going to go over very quickly, just as a quick example. The case of the scenario analysis in the basic version we would expect to see a bibliographical review by the country taking into account the findings of the IPCC as a starting point for or to begin thinking about the long-term scenarios. Also, we have to identify the information gaps and start the consultation process with all those institutions that would eventually help develop the, these steps in the country, the researchers, universities, research centers. The intermediate version will have some scenarios that are already aligned with the Paris Agreement, taking into account the quantified needs in terms of the amount of emissions that have to be reduced to really be within that objective in global warming. We have to start thinking about the uncertainty of the results obtained for those results to be more indicative. And well, I left that one in English, sorry, a consultative process with the different stakeholders so that the scenarios could really be realistic. A detailed version It already has several national scenarios. There are methodologies and models that are solid. A careful review of the results, hopefully peer review, and the cooperative process with different institutions. This is, again, a graphical description, a graphic description of how and why these strategies have to be constantly updated, constantly revised. The great lines in the number one are the ones that would be in a strategy presented in 2020 and that they present a business as usual scenario and a scenario where emissions are at zero by 2050. Then five years afterwards, 2025, and although there has been some progress, but we didn't get to that ambitious level, that ambitious scenario. So the measurements and the objectives have to be adjusted to be able to accomplish the recommendations that have been made by the IPCC in terms of science, but also to adjust this new business as usual with the policies that have been implemented. This is an example of a detailed version of a long-term strategy in terms of the scenarios and modeling. Is the one from Portugal that went through an iterative process. They had several rounds of models with different contributions. There are several in scenarios that integrate with the different sectors with specific recommendations for the country. 
And it went through a consultative process that was quite long and complete before the publication. So, what can the international community do to support the development of the future revisions of the LTSs? We could offer clear guidelines about the revision cycles, what they should include, some kind of uh, official guide on how to review these strategies. Other tools that could be useful could be online platforms. Although we have these type of spaces to share and exchange experiences and learn about the different approaches taken by several countries. And well, precisely this uh, first uh, round of strategies, some have already been presented. Many countries are working on theirs. And really, it's good to make an effort to be able to collect these experiences and use them to improve for the following cycle. So if there is a to answer, and I also leave you with the link where you can find the guide, the consultation process with all those institutions that would eventually help develop the, 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 these steps in the country, the researchers, universities, research centers. The intermediate version will have some scenarios that are already aligned with the Paris Agreement, taking into account the quantified needs in terms of the amount of emissions that have to be reduced to really be within that objective in global warming. We have to start thinking about the uncertainty of the results obtained for those results to be more indicative. And well, I love that one in English. Sorry, a consultative process with the different stakeholders so that the scenarios could really be realistic. A detailed version. It already has several national scenarios. There are methodologies and models that are solid. A careful review of the results, hopefully peer review, and the cooperative process with different institutions. This is, again, a graphical description, a graphic description of how and why these strategies have to be constantly updated, constantly revised. The great lines in the number one are the ones that would be in a strategy presented in 2020, and that they present a business as usual scenario and a scenario where emissions are at zero by 2050. Then, five years afterwards, 2025, and although there has been some progress, but we didn't get to that ambitious level, that ambitious scenario. So the measurements and the objectives have to be adjusted to be able to accomplish the recommendations that have been made by the IPCC in terms of science, but also to adjust this new business as usual with the policies that have been implemented. This is an example of a detailed version of a long-term strategy in terms of the scenarios and modeling. Is the one from Portugal that went through an iterative process. They had several rounds of models with different contributions. There are several in scenarios that integrate with the different sectors with specific recommendations for the country. And it went through a consultative process that was quite long and complete before the publication. So, what can the international community do to support the development of the future revisions of the LTSs? We could offer clear guidelines about the revision cycles, what they should include, some kind of uh, 
official guide on how to review these strategies. Other tools that could be useful could be online platforms, although we have these type of spaces to share and exchange experiences and learn about the different approaches taken by several countries. And well, precisely this uh, first uh, round of strategies, some have already been presented. Many countries are working on theirs. And really, it's good to make an effort to be able to collect these experiences and use them to improve for the following cycle. So if there is a to answer, and I also leave you with the link where you can find the guide. The guide's available both in English and in Spanish. Stefan? Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Well, perhaps I would like to ask you to copy the link in the chat so that those people that want to consult, uh, yeah, they can also have that at hand. I don't know if there is any question at this point. I don't see any question. I don't see anything here in the chats. I think it is also very interesting this uh, having this link to see this guide from the No Climate Institute so that each one of you can kind of get a context and uh, be able to, to analyze what this uh, revision is about and this could be helpful for you in this whole process to revise the long-term strategies. Okay, you have the link in the chat. Pablo is uh, writing that there are different versions. Also, it's available in Spanish, as he said. For those of you that want to uh, go over it and go deeper into what the guide provides. I'm just going to give a few more seconds to see if somebody has an additional question. If not, we have come like to the end of the presentation part. And what we have seen in this webinar was, as I was saying at the beginning, there were different perspectives, a couple of different cases. The case of Costa Rica, the case of Guatemala, where we learned about these different uh, routes that really respond to the national circumstances and how to link the indices in plans, policies, and also in the process for this uh, COVID recovery, and also how we link this to different areas and not see mitigation and adaptation separately. They also show to us a structure and how the process has advanced, the process for the update of the NDCs. While Maria Jose, with Maria Jose, we took more of the perspective on how one topic is integrated to the NDCs, let's say, uh, seeing this as a social intercultural process for learning
and the institutionalization regarding this macro framework of climate governance. And lastly, Pablo showed us a little bit how this interaction or this vision cycle, why it is important and the different degree of details uh, depending on the different needs and the availability of funds uh, of doing this zoom in and uh, let's say the different steps so i believe this does not give us the uh, definition the absolute vision i don't think that exists actually as sandra said at the very beginning but it helped us understand a little better which are the uh, different degrees of involvement in the different countries uh, which are the different vantage points uh, that are coming closer to this uh, climate um, governance process by the NDCs Having said this, now I'd like to open the floor for Sandra. But before we do that, I am I would like to invite you because uh, in, in within Voice Boxer we're going to have a little survey, a little evaluation, and I am going to activate that. Please take one or two minutes of your time to um, evaluate the different aspects of these meetings. It helps us understand what works and what doesn't so we can improve. I continue to improve this, uh, this, this way of uh, communication. And Catherine is also going to provide some closing words after this. What's next? Which are the next steps after this webinar? So allow me to open the floor for Anne Catherine. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so I am going to provide the uh, closing words for this session. First off, thank you to our three speakers, Pablo, Majo, and Diego. Diego had to leave uh, for their great presentations that they had for us today. I believe that we all have some important takeaways and important information it is very interesting what they presented. As usual, we're going to share the presentations with you so that you can actually uh, review with calm. And since we are recording these sessions, both in Spanish and the English interpretation, so we are going to share the link as soon as we've got it ready for all of you ladies and gentlemen. So you can expect that within the next two weeks. Regarding the next steps, we still have one pending webinar, which is part from the uh, AK interface. That webinar, we had it scheduled for December last year, but that didn't happen. We had to postpone it regarding green recovery. So we are rescheduling that for March. We will be sending you an email with the uh, exact date and the foreseen content for that session. As usual, we hope that you have enjoyed this session very much, that it was useful for your projects and the work you're doing. We invite you all to uh, participate in the uh, satisfaction poll, please. You can see it. On the left of my video, there is a little button. You can please um, fill that out. Also, we are always open to any kind of feedback that you might have for us via email. Uh, please, all observations, recommendations you might have for us. And thank you very much for the patience you had with us with this new 
tool. It's a voice boxer. It's the first time that we do this great tool. It's actually very good. We had a little technical issues, but I think we were able to come ahead. Uh, without further ado, I greet you all, wishing you a great rest of the day, a great day if you're still here, and we'll see you in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, anne Catherine. I can see that some of you are already doing the poll. As I was, uh, as anne Catherine was saying, this is right next, it's the button right next to the video where it says polls. Please, um, if you could fill out that poll, it would be enormously appreciated. You can rank, rate, um, the service from one to five. The worst is one is the worst possible. Five is the best possible. So, please uh, fill this out. And again, thank you so very much for your engagement, your participation, for having post questions that helped us elaborate a little further in uh, this reality. Thank you very much to our speakers for your presentations and we'll see each other soon hopefully march in our next webinar on green recovery thank you very much